welcome back to Stories in AI. Today, we speak with Daniel Hernandez, the general manager for IBM's data and AI division. I've known Daniel for several years, and he's one of the strongest technology leaders I know, very thoughtful, puts people first, and has his amazing ability to motivate a large group of people towards a common goal. Daniel leads one of the world's largest franchises in AI, IBM Watson. And in this discussion, we talked about the lessons that IBM Watson gave to the rest of the market, the state of the market today, the need for focus on data and information architecture to get AI right. We talked about trust, we talked about flying and AI, and a whole lot more. I really enjoyed this conversation with Daniel. I hope you do too. Daniel, welcome to Stories in AI. How are you this Saturday morning? Ganesh, thank you. Uh, very awesome. It's my wife's birthday. Uh, what better way to celebrate than to be with you? You know, happy birthday to your wife. It's uh, it's so awesome that she allowed you to do this little thing on your Saturday morning at seven a.m. Uh, but you know, thank you so much for taking the time. You know, this is this is. I'm, I'm, I was so looking forward to it because we were planning to do this for a few weeks, and then some one thing or the other, we we got through it. So let's get started with you and talk about. How did you get into AI, data and AI? Give us your story, your personal story. My, I would say my entire career has been focused on the domain or immediate adjacent domains in and outside of IBM. So, and it was mostly accidental. And, you know, I spent roughly 10 years in startup land before joining IBM. We were building geospatial analytics, field service apps, really data intensive applications. And when I came to IBM, I joined what was then the predecessor to data and AI. It was a division called information management. Mm -hmm. And it was building out the capabilities really from the database out. So master data management, ETL, data governance, analytics, predictive analytics, which starts to get into things like statistical machine learning techniques. And I had all manner of roles inside of IBM in this space product management, development, M&A, um, and now as the general manager of data and AI, which is home to uh, the capability that I originally joined, plus much more, including Watson. That is awesome. You know, that, you know and, and you, uh, we've known each other for, I don't know, probably about a decade now, right? And then I, I've been following your journey ever since the information management to uh, leading parts of AI and data to now, leading one of the largest franchises in data and AI and, and Watson, how better Watson made this market happen, right? With IBM Watson. And we've come a long way. So before we go into AI and the market, tell us as the GM for this largest franchise in the world for AI, what does your typical day look like? <laughs> um, varied. I'll tell you, and I would say this is probably true for all of my colleagues in IBM, but also, you know, people that are outside of IBM that have a similar role, my job as really a custodian of data and AI is on a day-to-day -day basis, executing on the promises we make, which are typically conveyed in vision and strategy, memorialized in plans. And on any given day, that might look like talent management. So trying to hire the best and the brightest uh, outside of the company, inside of the company into critical roles talking with customers, either informing them on what we're up to and how we can help them, uh, maybe even advising them on what some of their critical blind spots are. Typically that would be, hey, you're so excited about the power of say conversational AI, but you're not ready because you hadn't really considered these things um, to making sure that the trains are running on time inside of the business. At the end of the day, we are a product business in data and AI. That means our products have to be exceptional. They have to work better together. And at the end of the day, they have to deliver benefit to our customers. And so on any given day, I'll be looking at our technology. I'll be reading our docs, giving critical feedback to one of our many teams. Um, but I would tell you the best days are when I'm outside of the firm, talking to our customers yeah. and learning from them as much as you know, trying to trying to inform them on, on what we're up to and how we could help. Are you traveling, uh, back traveling again? Or are you doing it all remote now? I started traveling again. So I had my first real live customer meeting. I met 
with over, I think it was like three dozen executives in one of the largest telcos here in Dallas. Uh, I don't live in Dallas. I live in Austin, but uh, that was good. It was all, you know, ironically, socially distanced. It was outside. And so it worked. And I've got um, a slew of customer meetings that are live scheduled for late July. So it's definitely picking up. And it's for me personally, it's making a difference in like energy levels, right? Like when you and I meet live, uh, even though I was excited to see you virtually, the uh, I think the bonds just are uh, that much more, right? It's hard to replicate for sure. I I can't wait to get out there. And, you know, I've I've started doing some meetings, but still not too much. And uh, I miss that because it it just like, somebody told me this, um, you know, when you go to a party and there, you can kind of really find out what kind of person you are, right? When you go to a party and come back home, are you tired or are you wired up, right? I'm like wired up. I go to a party, meet a lot of people, come back up and I can't sleep for the next two hours, <laughs> you know, because I get the energy from people, right? So, and I miss that, that, that phys- you know, the in-person interaction. So, oh, that's, I'm glad the world is opening up back again. We're getting back to some kind of normalcy, right? Um, so, let's talk AI, right? And I can't believe it's been exactly 10 years since Watson played, IBM Watson played Jeopardy on TV, right? And uh, a lot of things have really transformed since then. I can't believe it's actually 10 years ago. And it almost feels like we've had probably, you know, I don't know, five decades of progress since then, right? There's a lot of changes that have happened in AI in the field, in the market. You know, what's your thoughts? And, you know, walk me through your, your view of the market. How have we evolved in the last decade? in AI. Uh, so you're right. We celebrated 10 years of Watson. We also celebrated 110 years as IBM. That was this last month. Yep. And so um, it's a, it's really is a storied history as an IBM I'm very proud of it. Uh, and I certainly feel a heavy responsibility to be a steward of uh, not just the Watson franchise and the work related to it, but um, carry on the legacy of IBM and, and, uh, move it to the, to the future. I'll tell you in the last 10 years, since we introduced Watson, you know, Watson itself is when we introduced it was largely a Q and a system, mm-hmm. the beneficiary of a lot of work in academia and IBM research, you know, we stood on the shoulders of many, many giants. And in the ensuing 10 years, I will tell you, we've learned from every conceivable mistake we could have made. Right. As in introducing something brand new, trying to create markets and try to scale this technology in the wild. When we introduced it, we proved the power of the technology, certainly in Greenfield, right? A Q&A system that can um, do speech to text, get answers to questions, determine with high accuracy the right answer to that particular question and then repeat it and do that at speed. Trying to apply this stuff in the real world where you don't have greenfield is all, is where you learn what works and what doesn't. And we certainly did. I would I would say just to label some of the lessons learned, the technology that we had then and that we continue to have now and you know it's evolved significantly since then is only one part of the equation you have to get right in order to deliver outcomes that matter for your customers. Mm -hmm. You got tech, you got people issues you got to contend with. You got process issues you got to contend with. You got cultural, often antibodies that are going to reject technology because it's relatively new. And so in the 10 years, try to apply it to any, I mean, all industries, multiple use cases. We basically figured out what works and what doesn't. Um, And that leads us to where we are now, which is kind of the focus on what Watson is doing today uh, for our customers. That is awesome. No, you're you're exactly right. And so other than the, and you're right, it's more than just the technology. It's more than just a core platform, you know, even for the market, right? I mean, back in the day, the problems were very much, can I build a machine learning model, right? I mean, after... Watson introduced from a language perspective, and we'll come to language in a bit. It was all about saying, hey, here's some frameworks, and here's pick a problem, solve it, right? To today, well, it's not a, uh, 
it's very it's a given that most organizations see AI as a powerful differentiator and an accelerator for their transformation journeys or you know just to be more competitive and stuff. And the problems you're solving are very different, right? I mean, even like from 10 years ago. What is the market today? Where is the AI market today? What are organizations still struggling with? What is already working? Uh, give us a view of that. All right, so let's maybe break down the categories. Um, so we say AI, what do we mean categorically, at least as far as the stuff that I, um, I'm focusing on through our team's work. Let's talk about conversational AI. So anchored on technology known as natural language processing and applied to customer care. I think we've got significant product market fit in that space. Mm -hmm. So NLP has been around for some time. We actually were using NLP techniques in the original Watson for the Q&A system. In the conversational AI world, this is a space that actually grew up through basic experiments. You would see things like virtual assistants on websites, uh, bots that are interacting you through uh, messaging. They were, they were cute and fun. Um, we're actually applying that stuff for customer care, full life cycle, really anchored on customer service. COVID forced a lot of companies to have to contend with the very real problem, which is significant inbound across multiple channels, not just voice, but text yeah. in search for either new services that you're eligible for. If you're a citizen to a particular government, whether it's county or state, maybe even federal here in the United States or new services you needed for from for-profit customers like the ones that we service today, you either had to hire thousands of people into the contact center to deal with that flow or you needed an alternative technique that would work and not just work over your voice channel, but work across text. The work that we were doing around Watson Assistant, which is our conversational AI, applied to that customer care, customer service style problem, delivered benefits that were even beyond what we were what we were expecting. We knew this stuff was good. I mean, this is a product that organically was, you know, doubling and growing, particularly in usage, not just the revenue. And we started applying it in a targeted way there, like the customer satisfaction for of the people that were interacting with it increased substantially, the cost savings associated with increased containment rates over traditional IVR systems made the economics like super favorable. And now we're enjoying the conversation with our customers and say, okay, what's what's next? How do we not just solve customer problems, um, you know, that are that are being driven through these interactions inside of your contact center? How do we deliver exceptional care in sales, in marketing, in promotions? How do we, in anticipating the customer needs before they even know them, address them and create delight throughout, um, not just for customers, but for even prospects. So that's kind of the conversational AI side. And there's a whole collection of technology beyond the conversational AI that related. So in some cases, for instance, where if you're interacting with me and I can't anticipate your need, I still want to offer you help. What kind of help? It could be, hey, here's a here's a FAQ that I might want to point you to in order for you to self-serve your own, own needs. It might be, hey, here's I, I can't, I'm sort of confident, but I'm not completely confident that this piece of content on the on my website or on the internet might be useful to you. We're able to deliver that kind of help through something called Watson Discovery, again based on NLP technology, primarily driven driving content intelligence. So basically, processing and analyzing documents, building critical insights from those, and using it in support of things like search in support of things like um, long tail help in this conversational AI use case, that's Watson Discovery. But in general, all around this customer care use case, I would say that's number one. When it comes to data science, um, building models, trying to put them into business critical processes, we've built out a tool chain to help you do that, leveraging all the open source that data scientists love, principally R, Python, and all the frameworks and toolkits that are built around those ecosystems. And we have the lifecycle management for those things, for things like model serving, model lifecycle management, mm -hmm. helping us deal with these very real business corpy problems like what do you do to manage those models and collection of models 
after the data scientist built them has gone away? How do we ensure that those things continue to, to, to deal with the original problem that they were designed? That's our Watson Studio stuff. So I would say conversational AI through Watson Assistant Discovery, kind of the uh, most interesting, and if you're one of our customers uh, that serve customers, like you wouldn't even know that the thing exists, it's just like behind the scenes. Watson Studio as our tool chain for data science is probably um, there. I, what, I, what I will tell you is like the proprietary algorithms, the proprietary tools that used to be the primary method that data scientists used their job, whether it was SAS, in my case, SPSS, in large part is being either complemented or in some cases are replaced with hmm. what's available readily in open source and what most uh, data scientists, especially ones coming up from school are using um, you know, in learning on. So it's interesting. I mean, if, if there is, so broadly you're seeing the two sides, right? One is, can I give you capabilities that are AI powered, like customer care is an example, right? That you can easily integrate, plug in and start realizing value ASAP, right? Yep. On the other hand, it's a development toolkit of, Hey, you want to build something because you have smarts and you have the people, you have the resources and you have something proprietary you need to go do. Here is a very um, accessible and evolved tool set, tool set that you can use to go do that, right? And that's very indicative of what we are seeing in the market, right? I mean, it's like it's the there is a lot of folks who are just consuming AI, if I may use that word, right? AI powered services as a RESTful API, as a service, as just as a delivered by an SI partner, or whatever. And there are folks who are trying to build something on their own, right, with AI and trying to make it as a differentiator. How about value realization across the two, right? One, I can make sense, like you bring the power, in this case with IBM, you they're taking customer care. You bring the power of IBM research, all the history, all the learnings, everything into them. They're going to realize value really quick. On the flip side, it may not be as differentiated for them versus them building something on their own, right? Which might be a little, depending on the business unit and what their business outcomes are going to be looking like. But in general, what, is, what has been the value realization with AI on AI projects across the industry, in your opinion? I, I would think about it in two ways. Let's talk about apps in general, mm -hmm. right? Like what I was describing around conversational AI to our customers looks like an app yep. focused on customer care. They actually don't care what the technology is underpinning it. They really don't care that NLP is there. They don't care that there are sophisticated techniques beyond NLP that help us understand your intent and um, resolve the customer interaction. Yep. In so much as, um, in so much as we deliver the outcome, which is higher customer satisfaction, higher containment to save money, they just don't care. And the same is true for other apps, like. We've got an asset management application called Maximo in this business. It's used by virtually every asset intensive company out there. So think of power generation, bridges, roads, that kind of stuff. They started injecting models that were built through my tools, Watson Studio in particular, into their application experience to help field service technicians anticipate um, predictive to predict maintenance, to optimize truck rolls, the customer of that application doesn't care that Watson is actually inside. The benefit of Maximo is what they care about, which is lower downtime, more efficient truck rolls, better capital uh, efficiency as a result. Same thing is true on Watson Assistant for the chief customer care officer that we support there. Same thing is true for the office of finance that we support through planning analytics, which has Watson built in to help you build and predict, uh, I'm sorry, build and run forecast budgets, plans. Mm -hmm. They just don't care. So inside of the application game, it might be controversial, but the value of AI is irrelevant. What values is what's possible within the application experience right. and the benefits that are, that are levied to the customer and to the users of those apps. So categorically in apps, AI kind of doesn't matter. Um, to the end customer when it comes to benefits yep. in so much as it doesn't yeah, help the actual application experience. Now on the building stuff, uh, it depends on how are you using these models, right? If, if I'm using these models in business critical processes like customer onboarding as a bank, 
Uh then the benefits are, are you able to detect fraudulent activity up front better, faster, more efficiently than, than before? Are you able to perhaps onboard people that would have been false positives on the fraudulent side and therefore enjoy the benefits of the revenue that that customer uh, now will bring to you. And so the value of what we enable through AI, specifically statistical t- uh, statistical machine learning technique uh, models or derivatives of them, really depends on the application of those models themselves. The value of the tools comes down to, are you enabling people to do their job better, faster, more efficiently? Um, are you equipping a broader user demographic to wield the power of AI than what you could if you didn't make it more accessible. Uh, but the nature of the value inside of the tools game is different than what it is inside of the app game, I would argue. Got it. No, it makes 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 total sense. You know, you you, um, you of all people have, more than most people I know, you have a very deep background in data, right? And deeper than most people I know. And you've talked about how you need to actually, you know, and we all know that AI is not just machine learning problem. Machine learning itself is a data problem, right? So what is the role of getting your data side of the equation right to do successful AI? Well, I did grow up in the data world first, right? And um, it was pretty it was pretty obvious then that the impact that you can make to your customer is largely correlated to your ability to find the data that you needed, to trust the data you needed once you found it, and to ensure that there were appropriate data protection around that data so that if you're to make it available to a broader mass of people, you're not you're not increasing your risk compliance yep. uh, uh, you know, surface or area, right? And so, I mean, and that was in support of things like predictive analytics, business analytics, self-service analytics through any any manner of tools. The broad application of artificial intelligence today, especially if you were to go back to kind of our taxonomy, like not the apps, but on the tool side, still is leveraging machine learning, supervised learning. Supervised learning needs data. And so the problem just, the problem I just described in things like data warehousing projects, analytics projects, is true there too. The difference is, most data scientists that we still talk to in the wild, in customers, don't appreciate the dependency they have on data. Mm-hmm. So they'll, they'll do things like subset data into their own little shadow system, create the models. If they're lucky enough to deploy the models, the majority of these are not actually being deployed in the wild still. We should explore that. And if there's ever any question, whether it's from a regulator, an internal auditor on Hey, you got to defend this model. Where did it, you know, how was it built? Where did it come from? What was it built from? (laughs) Like, there's no defensibility at all because the link between those models and the data are just basically doesn't exist. Right. So this is the, the data problem in AI is a very serious one. It's not getting, getting enough airplay. Our customers really don't appreciate the dependency. And because of that, and when I say our customers, I'm saying in general, the industry, right? Like the, um, and, and unless we, and until we begin to have a greater appreciation of this or have techniques that aren't so dependent on supervised learning, I think it's going to be a critical factor on adoption for sure. Yeah. And I don't know whether it was you or Rob Thomas who said it, like before you have AI, you need IA or information architecture. Elaborate on that a little bit more. Uh, uh, he said there is no AI without IA. <laughs> and he said that three years ago. And it was a... It was a simple way to describe what we just said in a lot of words. There is no AI without information architecture that's ready for AI. You need to have mechanisms to collect, organize, and analyze your data. And if you don't, any AI that's built on top of it, no matter the technique, is going to be dubious. So get the fundamentals. Like, don't stop in experimentation. Don't stop necessarily your AI project. But but ensure that you have proper mechanisms and good enough mechanisms to have your information architecture ready. The ability to collect, organize, and analyze your data. Uh, I, I get that, Daniel. But you know, the reality of data also is that 
we've been you know trying to evolve the data management practices for five or six decades right and these are things that are always evolving and changing is it going to be like if you go that path and wait for data to all be ready and prepare your information architecture in place and comfortable wouldn't it be too late to actually experiment with ai what's the balance here well to experiment i mean you said the magic word to experiment you don't need uh, the entire data infrastructure across the entire enterprise, across all your business units to ready. In fact, you may not even need any of it to be ready. You could do experimentation in a controlled environment with subsets of data in CSV files or raw data inside of a data lake that's been shadow copied out from uh, source systems and learn from that. In fact, a lot of what we do through our data science elite team, these are a collection of around 100 hardcore experts in data and AI that we make available to our customers, mm. like they, their whole game is give me your data, give me your, give me a problem. And I'm going to use my tools to go solve it. And typically the data is just like, you know, uh, it's protected, but it's subsetted out. And so for experimentation, you really don't need to wait at all. You can learn in a controlled environment with an, a non-optimized data architecture. But if you want to put this in business critical processes, that would, that could be a recipe for a disaster. Hmm. You know, you, you talked about hundreds of data scientists and stuff. So talent has been a huge constraint. Talent and resources, highly skilled machine learning engineers or data scientists has been a constraint in helping organizations really realize value with AI, right? Is it continue to going to be that issue? I know there's a lot of folks who are now getting into the market as newly minted data scientists and so forth. Uh, Affordability is also the other side of the equation, right? Since the supply is so low of good, uh, there is this statistic that says, um, I think we have about half a million machine learning engineers in the world compared to 20 million Java developers, to just give that perspective, right? How are we going to solve that for the industry? Is it just going to solve itself by getting more and more people trained? Or is it going to be solved through tools and practices? I'll tell you, it's much better today than what it was even three years ago. Mm-hmm. And I would say it's through the collective efforts of industry, academia, um, open source, which you know has required contributions from companies like us and our competitors. The situation is much, much better than what it was even three years ago. Go to Coursera, check out some of the curriculum, much of which is uh, powered by curriculum that we've contributed to, yep. free use of our own products for academic use, that's mostly true for even our competitors. And so we've made it, I would say as an industry, easier to learn, even if it's not through traditional learning in, in universities, the, the data science discipline. And while you're right, still not enough, it's just, it's trending right. I don't think anyone should rest on laurels here and just assume that suddenly there's gonna be an abundance of skills and you know, you're gonna have as number, you know, the same number of data scientists that you do analysts that can wield self-service analytics tools, but it is, it's trending, right? Obviously all of us have uh, a responsibility to do more, I would say. Now on the, um, here's what I would tell you is like the next level problem. These data scientists are being put not just in product teams to build stuff. They're being like hired into disciplines like marketing and sales to apply this stuff. And so data science is really, it always was, but especially now to solve the outcomes that our customers care about, they have to be multidisciplinary, right? So if you're learning data science and uh, Python, and you know, you're know you learning not just the Python language, but all the toolkits around it, scikit-learn, so you know, Plotly, you know, Dash, and you know all this other stuff, you get to apply it. Are you able to take a marketing problem and apply it? And can you speak the same language so that the marketers are conveying to you with high fidelity their needs, you're interpreting it with the same level of fidelity and you're able to turn it into um, a technology powered outcome. I, to me, this is, this is the next level up for us to really move on to the next stage of adoption across, across business for sure. 
I, I agree. I think, you know, storytelling and communication or just communicating the value of what they do is definitely, I mean, that's really, we see other than the technical skills that differentiates the really good data scientists from everybody else. So um, you are a, you're a pilot, you fly your planes. And a couple of weeks ago, you know, I'm still bummed that I couldn't, you know, I had something going on. I couldn't actually fly with you to Denver. And you've equated flying airplanes with trusting with AI and in terms of trust, how do you trust AI as a system and so forth? Can you elaborate on that and draw that parallel a little clearly? Yeah, I mean, so uh, the, the kind of planes um, that you and I would fly are, you know, general aviation planes, right? These are, um, th they're not the commercial airliners that real pilots fly. Yeah. Um, and whether it's the plane that I fly or ones like them, they've got highly sophisticated avionics that effectively allow you to push a button and have the plane fly as you need to the destination that you're trying to go to with a lot of complicated intermediate steps, like how to actually depart horizontally and vertically um, out of a airspace. How do I arrive at one? And so, you know, my brother, who's also a pilot, likes to tease me because he learned before all the sophisticated avionics existed using techniques that we would consider things like machine learning, really powering some of these avionics, a glorified button pusher. Uh, <laughs> he's like, you know, uh, you're actually not flying anymore. The plane is flying itself. In a way, he's right, right? We're deferring the stick and rudder techniques of flying to the plane and the obligation as a pilot becomes managing the entire process, right? Like making sure the plane is behaving the way that it should, that you instructed it properly, that it is like you're cross-checking is at this moment in time, is it doing what it ought to? And if not, why not? And so you're troubleshooting, you're risk managing. The nature of being a pilot just is leveled up a little bit. It's no longer hand on yoke necessarily, uh, like it was when he was there. And so uh, that delegation doesn't happen if you don't trust that the, out, that the airplane, for the most part, even though you're monitoring the system, doesn't do, if you don't trust that it does what it should do at that point in time, right? And so obviously the stakes are different there than when we're talking about customer care applications, asset management applications of this stuff. But maybe not, right? Like, I mean, let's talk about the, in the case of Maximo, we're trying to assess what is the appropriate moment to maintain this asset. What kind of asset is this? It could be a bridge, it could be a road. I mean, this is stuff, these are the kind of things that we rely on in our daily lives that we really don't think about. But imagine if we got that wrong, right? What is What would be seemingly low stakes decision-making or whatever, predictions becomes high stakes, dep you know, depending on the application in which that stuff is done. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in short, in aviation, uh, I think it's probably an understudied domain where algorithms and computers are do <laughs> like doing a lot of high stakes things. And the responsibility as humans is obviously to augment those processes, um, but to do some risk management and monitoring these systems and make sure they work as intended. So, so you use the magic words like trusting the system too, right? So how do organizations and leaders trust their AI systems? I mean, what is needed to happen for that trust to be established? Let's, um, let's distinguish low stakes stuff versus high stakes stuff. Sure. If you and I are, you know, enjoying time together and we pop up Netflix and the recommender of what we like, informed by all my past history, which is pretty esoteric, like gets the guess wrong, like who cares, right? I might upset you because like you're hanging out with me watching something you don't like, but it really, it matters, but it doesn't. Like we're not gonna, we're not gonna cry over that. We're not gonna die over that. And so trust in those systems, while it does matter, if you if you trust it but it doesn't deliver on you, the stakes aren't that big, and so it's it's a highly forgiving domain. Yeah. On the other hand, um, you know there are higher stakes decisions uh, determining who could be your customer, 
uh, determining whether or not someone is credit worthy, determining whether or not you are going to automatically process a warranty claim. Mm -hmm. Um, if, if you are deferring those decisions, if you are relying on those systems that, that are built and powered by AI to power those high stakes, uh, decisions and processes that you need mechanisms to trust that the stuff works. And so trust is kind of complicated. Like, why would you trust something? Um, I might trust something because it's understood. How do you understand how your process works? That's powered by AI. Well, you need some degree of explainability. You need some degree of transparency and you need those applied to things like the models that are powering the, the primitives that are powering these systems. Yeah. And depending on the technique you have, you, you, you know, your mileage will vary on your ability to do that. You need to trust that those things are current and up to date. If they're trained originally on a data set that historically represented your business, but then the whole market changes, how are you going to ensure that those models that were powered on that now, um, you know, bad data set have been retrained. Mm. And how do you know that they have the same level of accuracy? Like there, there's that. Um, if you're a regulator in, or if you're a, a, a entity who is responsible to a regulator and have to defend the trustworthiness, the veracity of those models, how do you support that process, right? Like these are all critical questions that you have to answer in order for you to imbue something with trust. Tools have a role to play here. So, you know, I talked about Watson Studio and the model serving model lifecycle management is in that model lifecycle management set of considerations that we are, um, we're focusing on this set of problems and we're trying to apply technology to help but it's not just technology. It's also in, you know, like what process do you have? What's your internal model validation routines and how are you going to assure defensibility with a regulator, whether that's internally done or externally done? Um, like you gotta, you gotta consider all these things for sure. Awesome. Awesome. Bring it home for me. Uh, what's your advice to organizations either starting or scaling their AI journeys? Um, I was on the circuit about two years ago, um, and it wasn't it wasn't really a novel idea. But I was saying, hey, uh, this is at the time where we were talking about robots and taking over the world, sure. and you know, general AI is right around the corner. The Hollywood so AI, the Hollywood yeah, AI. AI, right? I was like, look, our job and my job is to make this stuff boring. And in fact, I'm, I'm I think our teams are pretty successful in making AI boring. And things become boring when they become common. And they can only become common if they're useful by whatever your targeted demographic is. And for our case, it's obviously business. We're not, we're, we're, we're AI for business. And so what I worry about, what our teams worry about are all of these relatively, you know, what seem like hard uh, people process problems, like, we're, we're, we're focusing on that and trying to deal with it so that we can just put this stuff to work, mm. not just in the obviously exciting uh, ways, the stuff that would make it into the press release, but the, the pedestrian ways like, hey, let's service our customers better. Let's help our customers sell the right things to their customers in a way that helps their customers address the need that they, in some cases, didn't even know they have. Uh, so f for me, the future is the advancement of technology to make it pervasively available so that the stuff just becomes easy. A, yeah, yeah, it's and, a, and boring. It's, it's boring because we're not going to talk about it. Like, I'm not going to issue a press release on every amazing project that we've got because we would be doing that multiple times a day at this stage. Um, so I hope really as an industry, uh, we, we start evolving to uh, less... I'm going to inspire you on the power of AI to I'm going to, I'm going to educate you on what's possible and like, let's, let's celebrate the, uh, the more, the less exciting applications of this stuff. 
So, so uh, that's fascinating. Make AI boring. I like that. Hashtag make AI boring. So I tried it. It didn't work with our sales team, to be clear. So they, they said, hey, wait a minute. What are you talking about? Like, this is, uh, so no, I'm not going to do that because I've already been hazed once, but uh, I still believe in that basic ideal, right? That would be a great outcome. Yeah. So, so for advice to businesses and business leaders is, look, look for the tangible stuff where you can make a difference in your process, in your business. Focus on those rather than trying to do big bang. Is that the way I, I would? Here's it? what I would say, like um, to to end users, right? Whether they are the kind of companies that we serve or our competition servers. We think about AI. I would I would request you consider it in two ways. One, for a business problem you have, try to find an out of the box application that solves that problem. And if it happens to have AI inside that delivers better benefits, all the better. In other words, don't don't seek out AI, seek out solutions to the problem. And often there are applications that are already built that help you do that. Like don't start with the lowest common denominator, the models and the tools and whatever. The most expedient way for you to get an answer to your problem is to buy a solution that's ready made for it. In our case, it's planning analytics for budgeting, forecasting and planning. Watson Assistant for conversational AI in support of customer care, Maximo for asset management. You can, you can inventory solutions outside of IBM and kind of understand what the corollary would be for those. Um, and if, you, if you're a builder, whether you're a builder of one of those applications just for a different category, or you're a builder like a data scientist, a data engineer, an SRE team where AI has the potential to solve your problem, Validate the problem and validate that the technology actually does what you think it's going to do before you spend a whole ton of money trying to implement this stuff. Um, like it serves you, it doesn't serve you well as an end user if you're solving a problem that is um, like not anchored on hard facts, hard pain points that have yeah. dollars, cents, and you know maybe even risk and compliance uh, obligations associated with it. Awesome. Awesome. No, that's fascinating. Good advice. Um, what is one problem that you want everybody, all innovators and entrepreneurs to focus on in the future with AI? That's a hard question. Like, because I don't know. There's I'm gonna... too many problems to solve or because there are too little? <laughs> I don't know if there's a single rallying cry that I could issue for, you know, all practitioners, uh, all customers in sort of this space. Um, certainly as builders, we owe it to our customers to uh, demystify the hype, to apply this stuff in a way that helps our customers, makes the world a better place um, versus just, you know, being hype machines on plausible or even possible outcomes, but, you know, not anchoring this stuff on, on real, real issues. Um, as far as the domain, I mean, there's so many interesting, like emerging spots, like the, uh, the role and the potential of artificial intelligence in the quantum computing world, the merging of expert systems and other techniques through neural symbolic model, I mean, um, methods, like this is some of the stuff that IBM research is helping us advance through MIT, um, can actually actually stump the chump. So I, I, I you probably I don't know. I, you know, it's also I was also trying to get into your mind. Like, what are the things that are still worrying you, or you know, things that you think the world, the market is going? Just a you, you all, you, you already talked about a lot of things and how the industry is evolving. This is just another way to get something that I missed out in that in those questions, if you will. Um, yeah, I got some uh, rapid fire questions for you, and then you know we're. Like way more than I have so many questions, but I have to wrap it up. Uh, one is give me a story. I used to ask this question slightly differently in all my shows. It was like, give me an example or a story of how we will be interacting with AI in a hundred years. I don't ask that anymore because hundred years is too far out. I give won't me a story answer. in ten years. You know, we we're, we're from Jeopardy and Watson ten years ago to now. Give me a story ten years from now. Where will where will we be with AI? I think it's going to be invisible and powering most interactions that customers have with the firms that service them. Uh, you won't even know that it's powering anything. And even when you're talking uh, to a human or you're interacting with humans inside of the business, they're gonna be augmented by capability that 
turbocharges them, helps yeah. them make better, more informed decisions, even on creative tasks. Uh, but it, you know, I expect it to be pervasive, therefore invisible, and mostly as a result, just taken for granted, much like email is today. Boring and invisible. I like that. Yeah. Uh, AGI, artificial general intelligence. Do you fear that? Is it going to be possible or realistic in our lifetime to expect that? There are, you know, many contemporaries out there, Elon Musk um, and more that are taking on that particular topic. I'm not focusing on that at all. Um, our job is as practitioners serving our customers with the technology we have today for the technology is being born in IBM research to help commercialize it. Um, you know, I don't fear general intelligence. I don't fear, I don't think we're right around the corner from that at all. Um, and so I don't spend a lot of time uh, focusing our team's energy on, on that general, general question, to be honest. Yeah. It's funny. I say like, you know, I personally, I don't fear AGI. I fear narrow intelligence in the hands of bad actors, right? That's, that's a worse outcome than just robots taking over. Well, I mean, uh, any technology wielded by bad actors is a problem and artificial intelligence just is a different technological technique, but it's technology none, nonetheless, right? Like, um, I guess I have that fear pervasively across technology, not just across artificial intelligence. Um, that's my view, at least. Awesome. If somebody's watching this and they're trying to get into AI, what's one resource that you would recommend them? Go to IBM.com. Uh, give me your resume and come <laughs> join us. And, you know, let's fight the, the good fight for building this technology, responsibly putting it into the hands of our customers so that they can make a difference in the world. That's awesome. And how can the viewers and listeners get in touch with you? Where can they find you on the Internet? Uh, Dan Hernandez ATX on Twitter. Uh, Daniel G Hernandez is how you could find me in LinkedIn. Uh, and D G H E R N A N at us dot IBM dot com is my email. Hit That's me up awesome. anytime. That is awesome. Daniel, this was such a blast. I, I think that we should do another episode later on because I still have a list of 200 questions that I haven't asked you yet, but thank you so much for taking your Saturday. Happy birthday to your wife again. Thanks so much for getting on the show. Let's go fly.